Hi, I'm Austin, one of the owners of Griffin Armament, and the purpose of this video is to voice a couple of uh, concerns on raising awareness for the need for manufacturing in America, as well as to uh, help get the word out that we're looking for uh, manufacturing professionals in CNC turning setup and operation, uh, as well as uh, mill setup and operation. Obviously, production demands and requirements are pretty high right now and we're trying to grow, uh, but we've kind of, over the last eight years since we've begun manufacturing uh, seriously in-house, we've noticed that there's just a, an issue in America where there's not a lot of people entering the uh, manufacturing industry, the CNC operation and CNC machinist setup jobs, as well as some of the programming uh, people that write the code for the machines. Uh, and this is, we know this is an industry-wide problem for, for America as we talk to the application engineers that sell Okuma, DN Solutions, DMG Mori, uh, and others. And they all relate that all their customers are having the same issues. And I, I wanted to uh, essentially help people understand something that I think should be emphasized in the U.S. and that is that Manufacturing people are kind of the unsung heroes of this country. Uh, I hear people talk about the greatest generation in reference to World War II, and I understand that veterans like my grandparents made great sacrifices to protect our country and keep the world free. But it's important also to realize that uh, manufacturing strength in America and also in places like Russia and England uh, are part of what protected the world at that time. Obviously, we can look back and see that Ford produced something like 25,000 B-24 Liberators during World War II. Those are four-engine bombers. And uh, production on a scale like that, I believe would be really challenging for America today. And uh, I think that should be a, a source of concern for people as we look at increased tensions that our leaders are creating with Russia and with China. We have to understand that while we have some of the best technology and some of the best trained people, there's a reality that when you're in a time of, of war, if you end up in one, you're going to need production on a national scale uh, to equip the, the warfighters uh, to achieve the goal of, of, of victory. It's important to remember things like uh, in World War II, the Germans were Logi having logistical support issues and they were unable to keep gas and ammunition supplied to their tanks. And the Russian economy, uh, the, the sheer mass production created an unstoppable force for, for Germany that inevitably lost the war for them. And I just, uh, I see today, you know, a lot of people, it's not so much disrespecting as just not respecting the concept of American manufacturing. Infrastructure in the country overall could use an improvement. If you look at history, you can see that we were pioneers in railroad, and today we're one of the only nations that doesn't have high-speed uh, railroad. And maybe it's, it, it's a good time for us to uh, take that transcontinental railroad that we originally built and upgrade it, uh, because this is how we uh, ship things across the country when we want to export product or we want to import products. You know, one of our strengths is our ability to move that stuff around the United States. Also, I, I, was, I was recently in uh, the D.C. area, metro area, and uh, just to look around and see all the rusted guardrails and the kind of uh, aging infrastructure in, in that area being so close to the flagpole, uh, it helps you kind of realize how we're supporting uh, countries like Ukraine and uh, it seems we're not putting any emphasis on supporting ourselves. And it's important to remember that if we find ourselves in a great fight, we are unlikely to receive anyone's support. Uh, logistically, it's important to remember that in the manufacturing industry, this is just the foundation to emphasize strong manufacturing in the United States because we cut metal here on machines that are not often produced here. Uh, so we're, we're cutting American metal uh, on, on machines that are produced outside the country 
and we're often using carbide inserts that are uh, sourced from uh, places like Israel. Israel's home to Iskar, Carmex, Vardex. Uh, these are huge brands in the uh, machine tool, uh, cutting tool industry. And uh, also it's important to note that China is the leading producer of tungsten carbide, I, I believe, in the world. Uh, so ultimately, it's important for us to have a strong ability to be independent in our manufacture uh, of items in order to be uh, strong in our own national security. So when I talk about the fact that those uh, carbon inserts that support our operations and the machines that we use are often not produced in this country, I'm talking about the foundation. We, at the, at the barest foundation, we need a resurgence of the professionals that operate in industry to manufacture things here in the United States. And that will play into uh, an increased demand. And at some point you'll see uh, Americans produce those uh, cutting inserts and, and machines so that we can support our own manufacturing economy. But uh, obviously I'd like, I'd like to see us move in a direction where as a country we produce more and uh, are more independent and also uh, taking more pride in, in our own country. And it'd be great to see the government, for example, uh, supporting our infrastructure and understanding that every dollar we outsource is a dollar we don't uh, use to improve America. And uh, the America First kind of, kind of campaign that we see as one of the competing messages uh, just makes so much sense because we really need to support our own infrastructure and our own uh, ability to you know, have a bright future tomorrow. So speaking manufacturing, I'm here with Tom, and he's one of these uh, heroic characters that's, that spent and dedicated a lot of years to manufacturing products in the United States. Uh, and if we had a lot more people like him, we'd be in a lot better shape in, in uh, our global competition with the other countries right now. But Tom, could you walk us through what we're making just today in the shop. Absolutely. So here in this machine today, we're making Bushwhacker booster housings. So they're, uh, they've are they been in production for quite a while. We're working through them pretty good. Over here in this machine, we're actually producing our Bushwhacker can. Uh, we've had uh, a little issue with the parts ejector in the can. So the guys are working on that right now, to get us back up and going. One of the interesting things about a lot of our silencers is that we make uh, the tube housings in a lot of cases from solid 17.4 uh, bar stock produced in North America here in the United States. Uh, and that's because 17.4 is a very strong and a good material for pressure vessels. However, uh, it is, it's so strong in fact that it's difficult or near impossible to make a tube out of. So. Going to that extra effort, machining the part, uh, gets us a stronger tube housing. So this machine is making uh, pistons for the so booster we got, housings. We got an easy lock piston coming off the machine here. Correct. And we'll take you over to the other side of the shop and show you some other stuff. All right, this machine here is in a changeover. We're making cam lock piston inserts for SMG PCCs, half 28. Yeah, that's a smaller machine, a Lynx. Uh, so it's a smaller subspindle Y-axis turning center. And over here on my right, we have uh, a robot unloaded uh, Puma, and it's it's making Recce 7 uh, tube housing. So this is the rear mount, the tube machined of one piece of 174 cold form bar stock made in North America here in the United States. So here we're making one of the front caps for the dual lock in 30 cal. The machines are actually really cool in that uh, we, you, know, you put metal into one side and when your program has sufficient development, you make a component come off uh, in one operation. So part begins on the main transfer to the sub, finished, knocked out complete on the uh, conveyor. So over here, we're, we've got a vertical mill with a fourth axis making uh, carbine rails. These are SR, or suppressor ready rails. And uh, to our left, we have uh, another fourth axis 
Mill making Mark II lowers from uh, forgings of 7075. So we're here in front of another TT, uh, so a twin turret turning machine. So this one is making 30 cal Explorer Gen 2 baffles. Uh, we're currently doing the blast baffle, I believe. So that's what this is running. All right, so on this machine, we are making our untimed easy break in nine mil, half 28. So another Puma, uh, another twin spindle Y-axis single turret machine. Here we're making Recce 7 baffles out of solid bar stock as well for 30 cal. And Tom, over the over your career, since we were just talking about it, uh, what would you say has been uh, the progression, uh, positive or negative, in the industry? I would say the positive would be the amount of work that was sent overseas but then brought back. Uh, naturally, it was brought back to less people in the manufacturing field, which we need to turn around. I would say to make um, a lot more efficient, better products here in the U.S. So you're saying consequences when we move something over, we uh, don't respect those people's jobs, and then when we bring it back, they've moved on. Correct, correct, yes. Yeah. So we're getting subpar components, in some cases, not all, most likely from overseas that had to be brought back. But again, they brought back to less people who moved on either company-wide or to a different career path in general. So it'd be great to see if that transition could be more favorable for us here. Yeah, I got a lot of respect for the manufacturing people. I did some of the tech school that these people uh, go through, and that's a real hardworking endeavor. You gotta have a lot of dedication. There's a lot of attention to detail in these fields where these guys have to get a lot of things right on a regular basis to, and be consistent to be good. And uh, that's that's where you know these jobs just don't get a lot of respect, and I feel these guys are unsung heroes due to that. And, and other factors such as the fact that the United States wouldn't be the great place that it is if we hadn't had that incredibly strong manufacturing history that we've had. And so it's really important, it's vital, that we keep this, uh, these industries strong and healthy. So to just take a look at one of the turrets in this twin turret machine, we have uh, Sandvik drills with inserts made in Sweden. We've got uh, Cut, a cutoff system that's cutting with German inserts. We've got uh, Israeli Iskar inserts in a couple of tools, more Swedish inserts. And this part off system is, has German made inserts. So we have not one American made cutting uh, tool in that whole turret. So what was the point of that? The point is that that's, that isn't a really uh, healthy state of our manufacturing economy, in my opinion. Here up top, you've got an Ultra end mill. That, that company is an American company. We're grinding the carbide in the US and uh, they make a really good end mill. So I wanted to mention some of the American uh, items we use in the process. Uh, the, the chucks on the mains are Royal QG65. Uh, we've got some of their parts accumulators. They're made in New York. Uh, the mist away uh, mist collectors are made in the U.S. as well as uh, the high pressure coolant systems that we use, uh, which are LNS chip blaster systems. And I think that's uh, pretty good accounting of the American stuff in the process.